Welcome. We are delighted that you've joined us for the second session of Research, Reflect, Respond, an online series presented by JPRO Network and the Berman Jewish Policy Archive. We are so excited to learn with Professor Ari Kelman today. I'm Ilana Azen, the Executive Director of JPRO Network. First, we want to welcome you. JPRO Network works across the diversity of our field, and we are thrilled to have a diverse group of professionals from nearly 30 organizations registered for this program. We're very appreciative to those of you who organized groups to come together for watching parties. Thank you so much. Here's our agenda for the hour. Partway through, we'll break into small groups for discussions using the magic of Zoom. If you're watching on your own, you'll meet three or four other people. And if you are watching with a group, you'll discuss together live. Um, if you're watching with a group and your group is not listed here, please let us know in the chat so that we can make sure to organize the breakout groups accordingly. For those who are not familiar with JPRO, we are the organization of, by, and for everyone who works in the Jewish nonprofit sector in the US and Canada. We work with individuals and the field, and we focus on connecting and learning. Members of JPRO Network have full access to our programming, along with JPRO Online. This includes a free advising program, skill-based trainings, and professional awards. Our upcoming management masterclass has just a few open spots left. You can find out more information on our website or email us at info at jpro.org. We are grateful to be partnering with the Berman Jewish Policy Archive on this series. The BJPA offers a free searchable collection of over 20,000 articles related to the Jewish community, ensuring that existing research is easily and instantly accessible to everyone who needs it. Beyond being a research archive, BJPA also works to catalyze new research, analysis, and policy discussions. We are so grateful to Professor Kelman for teaching us today about Jewish students and the Israel-Palestine conflict on California campuses. Ari Y. Kelman is the inaugural holder of the Jim Joseph Professorship in Education and Jewish Studies in the Stanford Graduate School of Education, where he is the director of the Concentration in Jewish, of Education and Jewish Studies and is serving as the interim director of the Taub Center for Jewish Studies. Professor Kelman will share his research about how California college students are weathering the current political climate. Beyond that, we will have the opportunity to think about how all of us in our diverse roles and organizations come to know and understand the experience and perspectives of our audiences, clients, members, participants, donors, congregants, students, community members, and to think about who and what we might be missing and what to do about that. Welcome and thank you, Professor Kelman. Hi everybody, good morning, or it's good morning here. Um, it's probably good afternoon where y'all are. Um, so it's great to be here. Thanks uh, to Ilan and Erica for organizing this um, and uh, to all of you for spending your time with me. Let me, um, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to do a little bit of talking and then you're going to do a little bit of talking and I'm going to do a little bit more talking and then we'll all talk together. Sound good? I will know that sounds good because you're nodding. Um, all right, here we go. Whoops. Uh, I assume everybody can see that. So the research that I'm going to talk about today comes from a project that I did with my graduate students uh, over the course of the last academic year um, that culminated in the publication of an article or a report that we called Safe and on the Sidelines, which of course is in the BJPA now. You can search for it under that title and um, by my name. Um, and uh, and <clears throat> so it's not just my research, it's research that I did with my students who all um, who are Marva Marom, Ilana Horowitz, Jeremiah Lockwood, Abby Ahmed, and Maya Zuckerman. Um, and so together we did this, this research that resulted in the report that I'm talking about today. Um, so what we know, what we think we know about Jewish students comes largely through uh, newspaper headlines like this one from USA Today College, um, 
or uh, this one from the ADL report about antisemitism on campus, um, or this one from Mosaic, uh, which takes antisemitism on campus as a given and offers advice about how students might fight it. Um, these articles like these existed uh, before last year, um, and they continue on, uh, including one that I saw this morning um, on Tablet Magazine. But the assumption is that California, that campuses, college campuses, are uh, uncomfortable for Jewish students. Uh, range run, they run the gamut from uncomfortable to outright hostile, and the Jewish students uh, lack in some way the kind of wherewithal to uh, to address the the, the campus climate. Um, you also have um, outfits like Amcha, which uh, are obsessed with tracking anti-Semitism on college campuses and um, have a I would say an idiosyncratic way of tabulating um, events, but they're interested really in focusing on specific events and then publicizing those events um, beyond their local uh, impact. Um, and I, I'm happy to talk about Amcha uh, more, but my question, so my question came out of the fact that I not only teach on a college campus, but I live on a college campus. I'm a dorm parent, or as we're called here, um, resident fellows, which means that I live with my family in an apartment attached to a dormitory of 100 freshmen. Um, for many of you, this is going to inspire uh, laughter uh, or sympathy. I'll take both. Um, but it gives me an interesting perspective on, on college life. And a couple of years ago, there was a big uh, uh, discussion in the Student Senate about divestment and whether the, the Student Senate should vote up a resolution calling on the board of the university to divest from companies that do business um, the rest of companies that do business in the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip. And um, it was a huge debate. My Facebook feed was active and I was getting emails and phone calls about what was happening. And, um, and I happened to find myself at dinner one night at the dining hall, because I eat in the dining hall with some frequency as part of my job. That also inspires some laughter and sympathy. Um, and, uh, and I was, found myself sitting across from two students who I knew were Jewish. And they, um, <clears throat> I didn't know anything, I mean, I knew some things about them, but I didn't know if they were involved in anything Jewish on campus. I just knew that they came from Jewish backgrounds. And so I asked them, and the, I think it was like a Monday night and the vote was gonna be Tuesday night. And I asked them, I said, are you following this story? And are you gonna go to the discussion tomorrow night, the open session of the Senate? And are you gonna really, you know, are you gonna get involved in this? And, and one of them sort of said, no, you know, I've, I have a midterm Wednesday, I need to study. And the other one said, um, oh, I, I, kinda, I heard about it. And what's, the, what's exactly happening? And what are the terms of the argument? I don't really know. And, and so it occurred to me um, that what I was hearing was happening on my campus um, didn't square with my uh, very, um, my, my sample of two uh, students on my campus. Um, I think, and so it led me to wonder, like, is what we think we know about Jewish students on college campuses accurate to what Jewish students feel like they know about life on their campuses? And it, it led us to, led me and my students to formulate the following question, how do Jewish students make sense of campus politics? We started out being interested in anti-Semitism. Um, we started out tracking this on, along two axes. One was anti-Semitism and one was Israel and Palestine. And they intersect obviously, um, uh, and we can talk about how or why they didn't. So how we designed the study, which is to say, this is going to get really geeky in terms of methodology, but it's important because it's really, I want to be quite clear about how it was that we sought to understand the opinions of students. So we focused on California campuses. I'll explain why California in a second. We did our research between the end of 2016 and June of 2017. The report came out in the fall of 2017, right as people came back to school. We ended up with 66 semi-structured interviews, which included both like question and answer interactions and think alouds which meant, or stimulus response, where we gave students um, copies of some of the uh, excerpts from some of the articles whose, whose uh, headlines I provided before, um, and some of the other reports that have been written about students on college campuses, and asked them if those described their, if that was congruent with their experience of life on their campus or not. Um, and the, the interviews range from about an hour to about an hour and a half, sometimes as long as two hours. We omitted first year students because we didn't want the, um, the sort of noise, we wanted students who are comfortable on campus, at least as comfortable as students can be. Um, we didn't want the kind of noise of the transition to college um, being conflated with, with some of the other issues that, would, that we were gonna talk about in the interviews. And then we went after um, students who we described as marginally involved. This is, but this is, this is a, a strategic decision on our part and it's gonna inform this session that we're having now 
in some important ways. We didn't want students who represented organizations who were active in the leadership of those organizations. Because once we did that, we started wondering about all the different organizations and started our sampling method by making sure that we accounted for all of the Jewish student groups on, or all the student groups that had Jewish leadership on campus. And we ended up looking more at the organizations than at the students. And we didn't, don't care so much about the organizations, we care about the students. Um, so we went for students. It was impossible to say what an involved student looked like and what an uninvolved student looked like. I've been around campus enough to know that students go through a number of phases over the course of their undergraduate careers. Sometimes they're very involved in things and then they back off quite suddenly. Sometimes they're very involved one year and fairly disengaged the next. Um, and with places like Hillel as the kind of biggest Jewish game on campus, students are often, you know, they'll come to barbecues or they'll go to one talk a year, they'll go to one session, but they're not necessarily in the leadership. So we, so we went for students who are marginally involved. That is, if a student goes to kind of a few Hillel things a year, or, or you know, J Street U thing or an APAC thing, um, they were considered uh, viable for our study. Um, and if they were in the leadership of a Jewish organization, no matter what the Jewish organization was, we did not include them in the study. And I can talk about, I'm happy to talk about that um, uh, in the Q&A if you want. Um, so why went after the marginally involved? They're also the majority of students on campus. Um, even a good Hillel probably reaches, I don't know, 30%, 40%, I could be pretty generous and say 50% of the Jewish students on campus. But actually the majority of students are either completely un uninterested and uninvolved in Jewish life, um, or they kind of show up every now and again, but not with any regularity. Um, like I said before, students in leadership positions may be more likely to reiterate the stance of their organizations, which is fine, but that's a discussion that I think is pretty well documented and we didn't really need to go into that. Um, and second, as I said, third, as I said before, student involvement is not consistent. Why didn't we go after the more involved? Well, the more involved are a complicated group. They're not totally transparent. So um, a study by Ariella Cosman and Barry Kesar from 2015 found that APAC members were 80% more likely to report anti-Semitism than non-members and that Hillel members were around 50% more likely than non-members to report anti-Semitic activities. I'm not totally sure how they track Hillel members because Hillels don't have membership. Um, but in any case, those who are more involved in, like those who are involved in APAC, for example, um, if we can just assume that involved students equal members, um, they were far more likely than other people who report anti-Semitism, which, which suggests a kind of conflation of political attitude and um, an impression. Um, and one that we felt like was going to, again, cloud what we wanted to do, which was to get outside of the committed core of these organizations and get to the majority of students, or where we thought the majority of students lived. Um, the second quote from Sachs and everybody, I'm gonna just gloss over, but it's in their report from 2016. Um, they're a little bit more, um, uh, I'll say, um, uh, equivocal about the role, the relationship between involvement in political groups and, um, and impressions of one's life on campus. Um, so why did we pick California? Well, A, uh, we are in California, so it made it convenient, but B, um, the, Calif the University of California campuses were highlighted as, as hot spots of anti-Semitism by the Cohen Center in 2016. And each of the campuses in our study, and we picked five of them, uh, Stanford, UC Berkeley, San Francisco State, UC Irvine, and UCLA, all five of them were ranked in the top 20 worst campuses for Jewish students in 2016, as tabulated by the website, thealgaminer.com. There's the header from that report. But so we figured that if we were gonna find places that were particularly difficult for Jewish students to be Jewish students, we would find them in California. Um, that is, if we were gonna find evidence of students who are really either um, experiencing a, one of the worst colleges um, for their lives or, um, or a place where anti-Semitism was really prominent, or, or kind of threats to their well-being were really prominent, we would find them right here in our own backyard. So that's why I focused on California campuses. <clears throat> Incidentally, I tried to get a project where we were gonna look at other campuses. Um, I, had, uh, I had five other campuses selected and I started conversations with a couple of them um, and we were unable to secure permissions and funding for that, those studies um, from those campuses. Uh, so, uh, so we stuck around in California, which does limit our ability to generalize. I understand that, but also I, I don't think we're trying to make an argument. We don't make an argument in the in the in the, in the report um, about generalizable things. We really focus on students in California, but I do think that if we can, if five of the worst twenty campuses are in California, or actually the campuses that we studied, then there is something that is generalizable as a representative sample of some of the worst campuses for Jewish students. Um, and so we would expect to find lots and lots of evidence um, of anti-Semitism uh, on these campuses. Um, 
So we're about to move to the small group discussion, and I talk up until now not about the findings of the study, which I'll get to afterwards, but about how we got there, who it was we talked to, and why we made certain decisions about who we talked to. Um, and I think that's important because often we get stuck in these, um, you know, uh, in these kind of echo chambers of opinions. We get stuck in our professional networks. Um, we get stuck in our communities. We get stuck in our families. We get stuck in our Facebook feeds who are, everybody is there um, by choice more or less. Um, and I'm not saying that we all need to go out and read uh, newspapers or news sources that, uh, that are directly opposed to our, our mental health or our kind of um, political perspectives. Um, but there is a sense that we think the entire world looks like the evidence that, that uh, moves in front of us. And so Daniel Kahneman in his book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, has this rule that says what you see is all there is, which he uses, it come, he uses it as a kind of refrain in the book very cleverly to say that often you, you, you see a very small segment of the world and you think that that's all there is. And this happens for him kind of all over the place. You think that is representative of the entire world. Um, and it rarely, rarely is. It's his point. Um, and so what I want you to do as you're in your small groups, and some of you are in, in professional settings already, others are going to be put in conversation with people, um, with, uh, with others who don't share your professional context necessarily, um, is to think about what are the sources for your information about college students? Where do you come to know um, about life on, on college campuses for students? Um, who are the people or audiences you hear a lot from about college life? and Jewish, the experiences of Jewish college students. Um, even if you hear directly from some Jewish college students, I want you to use this opportunity to think uh, hard about who those students are, where they come from. Um, I've been in too many rooms where, uh, uh, Jewish professional, Jewish communal rooms, where someone says, well, my son or my daughter, um, and uh, at that point, I'm always, I, I, I don't do this, but I'm always inclined to say, well, hold on a minute, you know, that's, is one student who's reporting directly to you, like who you know, who, you know, and you're a Jewish professional. And, um, they're probably, are they kind of representative of, of a broader segment of Jewish students? Um, so who are the people who you hear or audiences you hear a lot from? And then who are the audiences that you want to be learning from or that you want to be engaged with? So a lot of talk in the Jewish community always about engagement and outreach. Um, now is a chance to think hard, especially in terms of, uh, of college students. Who are the audiences that you want to be engage with that maybe you're not or that you're trying to be engaged with um, but whose voices you are um, you're not yet hearing with some regularity in your knowledge networks um, I'm now going to turn it back to Alana who's gonna facilitate the uh, the breakout rooms via zoom perfect thank you so much um, so in a moment Erica is going to magically send you off either into a room of one if there are multiple folks um, and a, a Zoom facilitated small group if you're on your own. We will chat the discussion questions to you and um, you'll be prompted when you have one minute left. You don't have to actively rejoin us. When that minute ends, you will be whisked back into the big Zoom room. Um, so please enjoy and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Back everyone. Okay, we hope your discussions were great. And um, Professor Cumming, we will turn it back to you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I will pick up more or less where I left off. Uh, I talked about the methods, and now I'm going to talk about our findings. So these are like very, very broad strokes. The report goes into greater detail and provides lots and lots more evidence of them. But there's seven of them that I think are important for our conversation today. They're related, and then I'm happy to answer questions as they come up. I'm gonna blow through these pretty quickly. These are just the demographics of the student. The students, how many identified as female, how many identified as male, where they live, which I think is important as we're thinking about students, not just as people who take classes, but who are involved in a particular social context in a very intensive way. Um, there's where they break out um, in terms of their campuses, the five campuses. SFSU is, a, is really a commuter campus. It was very, very hard for us to get students to respond to our inquiries. We tried a bunch of different ways, um, but we did manage to get some. And then uh, the last one is, um, is whether or not they've traveled to Israel. We didn't ask them explicitly if they went to Israel, but it came up obviously in a lot of the conversations. So about a third of them haven't gone, about half of them have gone, half of the half have gone with Tuglit, which is consistent with what we know about people in this generation. And then 18 uh, didn't say if they went. So the first most important thing is that actually students feel safe on their, on their campuses. Um, this struck us, this was really consistent across all the interviews that we did. Um, and um, and it, it struck us as quite good news. <laughs> um, so Amanda, I'll give a quote because uh, that's what we really worked with 
were these narrative responses. Um, I was never really harassed because I was Jewish. Actually, on the contrary, people think it's cool that I'm Jewish and I love talking about it. So I've never had anti-Semitism against me, said Amanda, who was at the time a senior at UC Berkeley. The names are, are, are pseudonyms. The classier and the campus are accurate. Um, but uh, the students feel safe on campus. They all reported this. None of them felt like their campuses were unsafe um, to them as individuals or as Jews. Um, and so actually this is one of the reasons that Stephen Cohen's suggestion that I took the term anti-Semitism out of the title because it actually is kind of a non-finding. Uh, we didn't find that it was a, a consistent characteristic of the campuses that we were looking at contrary to what the newspapers had reported. Um, and students didn't characterize their campuses. So they felt personally safe. They also didn't characterize their campuses as anti-Semitic. Sam, a sophomore at UC Berkeley, said, when you're, when you're writing, he gave us this piece of advice, when you're writing, downplay the fact that while Berkeley is a hotbed for political activity, people aren't walking around getting beat up for being Jewish and beat up for being Palestinian. It's a safe place for everybody, but it just has strong political activist opinions. People are going to voice their opinions. If you're going to be here, you need to learn to be tolerant, said Sam. So this actually came, um, one of the reasons I really appreciate this particular insight is that it came unprompted at the end of the interview. We close all of our interviews by asking them, asking students, I mean, this is, a pretty typical thing, you ask your respondent if there's anything else that we ought to know. Like anything that we didn't ask about that you want to tell us. And this is, it was at that point in the interview that Sam told us, uh, that Sam shared this piece with us, um, where he says, Berkeley has this really bad reputation of being um, quite politically active or has a reputation for being politically active, um, but it's not a hotbed. It, it is a hotbed for political activity, but nobody is really, no one's getting beat up. Um, it's, it can be tense at times, um, but it's not threatening and it's not anti-Semitic. Uh, um, students strongly rejected the conflation of being Jewish and being involved with or engaged with or supportive of Israel. This is pretty complicated, um, pretty complicated stuff, but I'll say that the students by and large had very sophisticated readings of, of uh, why and how they drew distinctions between those things. So Sharon, who's a sophomore at Stanford, expressed her discomfort that often Jewishness is conflated with being Israeli, um, and she explained that Jewishness can be very separate. Alexandra Stanford said the words aren't interchangeable. Jews aren't interchangeable with Israel. They really, they bristled at this. So that even as complicated as it is, and I think probably for all of us on the call, the relationship between what it is to be Jewish and what it is to be involved with Israel or what it is to be Zionist are, are closely related and we can't really pull them apart. Um, for some of us we can, but the students actually were pretty clear that for them they could, uh, they could separate the two and they um, bristled at the fact that, uh, that they, people use them interchangeably and sort of conscripted them into conversations they didn't necessarily want to have. Um, and they, the fourth point is that they struggle with Israel. This should not come as news to anybody. Um, Rachel said it the best, ah, oh, Israel's like home and all the times that we were all killed and stuff. That's why I'm so conflicted because of course I want to feel like there's a home that's safe and that we deserve. And at the same time, I don't want that home to be at the expense of another group of people. This sentiment was shared by a lot of students kind of said in my family or in my Hebrew school or in my community, I was taught that Israel was like this. And now that I'm kind of developing a more sophisticated worldly perspective um, and really forced on my own to think about my own ethics and my own political commitments, um, Israel is, is a more problematic thing, but I wish it was different. I wish it was like the Israel that I was taught when I was a kid or that my synagogue kind of, um, you know, uh, there the, the was the Israel of my synagogue. And so we heard that a lot from students. Um, number five, students feel the social pressure of politics. Um, students are not, as I said before, just people who take classes. Students are, um, they live in a cultural context, a social context that is really intense. Their peers are incredibly important to them, not just as friends, but as other members of this really unusual community. Um, so uh, Sheva said, when there's students who don't understand the same attachment to Israel that I feel uh, and don't recognize that and are more engaging in the conversation from an attacking line, I feel like sophomore year I was at risk of losing communities based on my beliefs. That is the social pressure and the political, one's social pressure and one's political attitudes um, uh, can come into conflict. And at the risk of losing one's communities, as Eli Sheva said, uh, you may or may not be likely to speak up and say your piece. Um, I, will, I will add that, um, a reaction that I've gotten to this finding is that students just need to learn to stand up and speak their mind when they feel passionate about something. Um, I, I would, I would uh, encourage every grown-up um, to think about doing that in every situation. Um, Thanksgiving dinner tables, professional settings, your very your own communities. Um, we're not, grown-ups are not very good at doing that. 
either. Um, and often we, we, all of us, myself included, make calculated decisions about when to articulate a, a political difference with somebody and when not to. Um, we've probably all been on planes where that's been the case or sitting next to somebody um, with whom you have no relationship. You have three hours in a chair together, but, um, but really talking deeply about your own politics uh, can be scary for a lot of people. So to just say like, oh, students just need to be fortified, um, I don't think actually reckons with the really um, powerful social dimension of uh, political engagement, particularly with people that you, that you do have longstanding relationship with. Um, adults, I find, often are, are not very sympathetic to this, the way the students feel um, and are, as a result, not very reflective of, of their, own, the, their own ways that they negotiate these political differences. Um, uh, so as a result, Students, as like Rob's, um, often choose silence. Um, David, a senior from UCLA, said, if I join them, meaning um, if I join people who are uh, pro BDS or uh, critical of Israel's policies, it's kind of on the assumption that I hate Israel. It even feels like kind of betraying my family and my friends and even just other Jewish people because there's such a strong connection between Israel and Judaism. David rejects that connection but understands that it exists for other people, particularly those in his family and his home community. Um, I'm pretty sure if my memory serves that David identifies as Orthodox, or at least came from an Orthodox background. But he says, I can't voice a separate political opinion because it feels like I'm betraying my family and I'm stuck. So I just, so I step out. I, I as we say in the title of the, of the project, I, I spend the conversation on the sidelines um, rather than engaging in a debate that I, don't, I feel like I can't be true to myself and my roots. Um, finally, and this is a finding that's most um, uh, serious for Jewish communal organizations, for Hillel, for other Jewish student groups, is that Jewish students opt out of Jewish life because of politics. That is to say, the, the tense way in which the politics around Israel Palestine play out on campus um, often encourage students uh, or present students with the occasion uh, following the silence strategy um, to step out of Jewish life or avoid uh, Jewish organizations entirely. So Amy, who's a sophomore at UCLA, um, who's actually one of our more politically conservative students that we spoke with, self-identified politically conservative, said, I grew up Bruins for Israel, which is a pro-student, pro-Israel, quote unquote, pro-Israel student organization, and Hillel together because I feel like a lot of people on the board are also really big in the Hillel community. That's kind of a turnoff for me. Even if I want to go to Shabbat dinner and stuff, I feel like it still has that political climate, which I'm not a fan of. Um, so rather than go to Shabbat dinner, which is ostensibly a non, an apolitical setting, um, I presume, um, she feels that the Hillel is kind of dominated by Bruins for Israel. Um, and she avoids going to Shabbat dinner at Hillel, which I think is, um, is too bad. And so for Jewish organizations um, on campus and off, um, this kind of, uh, uh, the, the fact that Israel is, is a turnoff for Jewish students, to use Amy's language, um, is, is a bit of a problem. They can't find a home in the Jewish community because of the politics of the Jewish community, um, and they don't necessarily find a home elsewhere either. So just to recap, uh, and then we'll go to the questions. Um, Jewish students feel safe on campus, on their campuses. They do not characterize their campuses as anti-Semitic. They reject the conflation of Jew Jewish and Israel. Um, they struggle with Israel and what it means to them, what they learned about Israel, what they were led to believe is true about Israel, and what they are now coming to understand is true about Israel and its politics. Um, perhaps that's a disjuncture between the idea of Israel or what Israel could be and, and the way that Israel acts as a, as a state actor. Um, students feel the social pressure of politics in their community. And the last one should say that students often choose to opt out of the Jewish community um, rather than, um, than engaging, than participating in a community in which they don't feel comfortable and frankly who can blame them um, oh, this is this is a better version of that last slide sorry it's the same thing um, I must not I didn't delete the previous slide sorry about that well keynote screw up. Um, so this is the so all of this goes into the study the report which came out last fall it uh, goes into all these topics in much more depth with many many more quotations and more nuance than I was able to present today because I was trying to keep things brief um, and I'll also say so our, our report came out which is a qualitative report based on California campuses like I said before um, deep long intensive interviews um, <clears throat> and we uh, sent this out in the fall uh, right as people were coming back to campus in December much to my surprise and, and pleasure the, the, um, social, the Center of Social Research Institute at Brandeis University released this report called The Limits of Hostility, Students Report on Anti-Semitism and Anti-Israel Sentiment at Four U.S. Universities. So these were not the same schools that we looked at. These were not interviews. This was not an interview-based study. This was a survey-based study um, in which um, the Brandeis group um, asked similar questions and actually came up with similar answers to us. 
that we found. And so the fact that we have a California sample, qualitative, a, a, quant a quantitative sample that is not based from California campuses. I think the campuses are, I'm gonna get this wrong, but I think it's Brandeis, Maryland, Michigan, and maybe one other one. Um, somebody can find that and put it in the chat if you wanna know. If you Google the limits of hostility, Brandeis, you can find the whole report. But basically our findings are in alignment. And so for us, this was, a, this was a fantastic, I was nervous when I saw that they had released this report because I wasn't sure what they were gonna find, but the fact that we actually had agreement about the ways that the students felt about their campuses, about the ways that they interpreted anti-Semitic acts on their campuses when they existed, um, and the way that students uh, respond to um, the politics of Israel and Palestine on their campus um, were very, very much in alignment. And so for us, this was an incredible validation. Um, we now have a quantitative report, we have a qualitative report, we have interviews, we have, we have um, uh, statistics, um, we have, uh, different representations from different kinds of campuses and different places in, in, in the United States. And I really feel quite strongly, even strongly, even more strongly than I felt before after we finished our research and our report, that, um, that we're really capturing a story about American Jewish college students um, that has been very much kind of pushed to the margins um, uh, in, in past years. And so I'm going to uh, close there. I'm going to close my part there. I think I'm supposed to stop my screen sharing. Is that right at this point? And then I'll be able to see all of your beautiful faces and I'm happy to take questions both uh, orally and um, in the chat and I'll do what I can to, to, to answer them. Thanks so much. Oops, wrong button. There we go. Okay. So we'll invite you to unmute yourself if you uh, have a question. Hey, Ari, it's David Manchester at CJP. Um, hey, so I guess my question is, we're focusing a lot as a community right now on BDS and fighting BDS. And to what extent do you think that focus takes away from what really would be the outcome objective of American Jewish communal organizations? Um, and so it's really serving as a distraction to our organizations and work on campus, um, defending this instead of really seeking the goals that we organically would seek to accomplish. Um, it's a good question. I mean, it, it's a matter of where you want to focus your, your attention. Um, if you want to focus on sort of fighting a, a, a movement, or if you want to focus on building a community from within, you can probably tell by my language where I think the right, what, what a, a wiser strategy would be. Um, I mean, to be perfect, like, to be kind of honest, I, I think BDS is a bit of a red herring. Like, for all the, the fire that, and attention that they get, and I, I sort of don't want this conversation to become about BDS, um, specifically because you asked, I think on college campuses, it's, it, it doesn't have the kind of traction that other things have, and students can align with it, they cannot align with it. Some Jewish students feel like, you know, boycotts, the rest of the sanctions are like viable modes of nonviolent political, of registering nonviolent political thought. Um, I can disagree with the movement. I can disagree with some people within the movement. Um, then you end up in this very kind of hair splitting mode. Um, I think probably much more productively, at least from what we heard from our students, if you want to try to fill in the holes that our students identified, um, it's trying to find a place for those students who feel, ex who feel like they don't want to walk in the door of Hillel because they don't feel like Hillel represents their, their politics. Um, or students who feel like they don't have a home on campus either with in activist groups or in Jewish groups, um, because the, they say the activist groups don't understand why they love Israel in a deep way and still object to its politics, and the Jewish groups don't understand why they are critical of Israel in public. Um, from, from my perspective, <laughs> serving those students is much more important than trying to sort of prevent them from or, or organizing around a, a, a political organization that honestly hasn't I mean, if you look at what they've done on campuses, it's not that much. Oh. Hi, Ari. This is also David, also a CJP, um, but the other one. Uh, I work on our birthright program uh, where we fund birthright professionals at Hillel's around the country. Um, and my question is about professional burnout. Um, a lot of my campuses that I work with have been experiencing or have experienced in the last several years BDS pushes. And one of the most challenging parts of my position is keeping those coordinators focused on birthright and those jobs. So I was wondering if 
we've done any research or we have sort of any sense about the effect of BDS on campus on the actual professionals at Hillel, the Kabads, who are on the ground dealing with that? That's a good question. I don't, I don't have those data. I haven't done that study, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. Anecdotally, I hear that's, I mean, I hear all that's, uh, all those things are tough. And I hear from Hillel professionals, the Hillel professionals that I talk to, um, or the ones that talk to me, um, I often hear them say the, the sort of Israel conversation, when it flares up in particular, occupies so much of their time and attention, and it takes them away from their ability to really do the other kind of work. Um, they feel like they're putting out fires as opposed to, you know, strengthening the community or, or providing students, providing for students in different ways. Um, so I do hear it's, I don't hear it in terms of burnout in the way that you do, David, but um, I certainly hear a kind of like, um, ex uh, exhaustion and a little bit of a sense of resentment that the conversation takes up so much, can, not does, but it can take up so much of their time and attention. Um, uh, from time to time and they get a um, lot of, like and they get a lot of external pressure right the consul is calling the federation is calling whoever is calling um in ways that if they're doing the sort of like uh other kind other kinds of of programs for their students and for the campus community uh they don't get people breathing down their necks in quite the same way nor do they get the same kinds of support i would like to ask a, oh, not a question, but rather present a framework that uh, I think is uh, is is important. I see what is happening on campuses in California and elsewhere as a sign of a broader uh, phenomenon. I call it desrealization, and uh, re-israelization is a goal of every organization that uh, that tries to change the situation on campuses. Uh, the problem is that it lies outside of the experience of most. Do you think that uh, the issues such as desire for normalcy and uh, the fact that Jewish history in the States have been taught to begin with Holocaust, so there is a dearth of understanding of a much broader context in which Jews interact with non-Jews and the fact that the second factor that I'd like you to uh, comment on is the emergence of uh, social justice as uh, sort of quasi-faith that uh, unites uh, all or most people on campus, but presents a unique challenge for Jewish students. Um, thanks so much. Could you, I, I'm unable to, I don't recognize your voice, I don't see your name. Could you tell me who you are and where you're from? My name is Boris Gorbis. I, uh, I'm calling from Los Angeles. I run a or founded um, a museum um, that we call America Israel Museum. It's presently only in virtual space. Uh, I came to the States in 1975 from Odessa, Ukraine, and I had two uh, students uh, at home or had. Uh, so my experience with campuses was also based on the exhibits that we tried to place on various campuses here in Los Angeles by the America Israel Museum. Cool, thanks so much. Um, I have to admit, and I don't mean to be um, sort of uh, difficult here, but um, I'm not totally sure what, uh, what you mean by de-Israelization and re-Israelization. Um, I had lots of students in the study who expressed complicated relationships with the state of Israel. And I'm not sure if they represent- If I may clarify? The Israelization is the various processes where the existence of Israel, for whatever reason, is irrelevant to one's definition of his life, or is relevant in a negative sense. Uh, those are different. Those are different things. That is, I can say, uh, I have no relationship with the state of Israel, um, which is probably true. Of, well, whatever. I can say I have no relationship with Israel. I can say something uh, slightly sharper about the existence of the state of Israel. Um, but those are those are different ideological commitments. Those are different kinds of uh, conceptualizations of one's relationship with the state of Israel. Um, and I actually think that putting them together in that way um, doesn't help our students find ways to articulate their relationships with the state of Israel. Um, and so I can so I'm going to leave that one there. Social justice. I, um, uh, I understand among some in our community, social justice is 
the sort of rallying cry as you are claiming it is about them. Um, and other people seem to think, and I think I'm detecting this in your question, correct me if I'm wrong, that social justice is, um, is leading Jewish students astray from uh, things that quote unquote really matter. Um, from my perspective, uh, social justice um, is a pretty broad term. It represents a lot, a lot of things. It can represent, um, uh, it can represent civil rights, commitments to civil rights in the United States. Um, it can represent fighting for the rights of Palestinians. It can, um, it can represent simply making sure that the justice systems, wherever those justice systems are, um, treat all of the people who are under that system of justice fairly and equally, um, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, so I, uh, um, I, I don't think it's held as a religion. I think it's kind of like, a, I would, I, I, maybe it's, maybe I would call it closer to Robert, uh, Robert Bella's notion of civil religion. That is to say, there is a belief in justice in the United States for sure. Uh, young people, uh, idealistic as they might be, believe that justice is worth pursuing, um, uh, Jews and non-Jews alike. Um, and uh, where and how that happens in the world, to which communities and in which ways, I think is a, is a much more complicated, slightly different question. I'm not sure I, I feel comfortable uh, clearing some of the uh, misperceptions. Social justice essentially is based on absolute equality of everyone, uh, no matter what they are, which in my, from my perspective leads to the creation of false analogies and uh, equalities between different phenomena, different people, the different actions. But fundamentally, it stems from a very simple fact in the past, 50 years, we have uh, the, the, the narrative, the Jewish people, somehow became secondary, if not defeated by the narrative of, of the Palestinians. And that is, uh, I think, is, is, is the fundamental root. At present, we're dealing with the crises. Uh, for over 50 years since the emergence of Israel, Israel was perceived as a, crisis, as a country in crisis. It's in conflict with the perception of Israel as a startup nation, as a military force. So there, is, there are many cognitive paradoxes for, uh, uh, not just for, for, for students, but uh, for I, Jewish adults. I agree there's a lot of paradoxes um, at play here. I don't think this is the right context to talk about those, um, conceptions of justice, conceptions of historiography or historical narrative, um, but I appreciate your insights. And I think there's a question from somebody from, uh, UJ Federation of New York, if I'm not mistaken. Hi, my name is Ila Baleli, and I'm, call, I'm talking from the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. Right. Um, I'm an Israeli, and I live here for the last 18 years. But one thing that I got of this, that not all Israelis agree with Israeli politics as well, and not everything is 100% here as well. We are still Americans. We have one president, we agree or not, the same in Israel. I think one of the issues with the kids these days, they don't, like the connection between Judaism and Israel is 100%. That's the Jewish, Jews of, uh, the Jewish land. We can't ignore that. And Israel represents that, first of all. The fact that people don't necessarily agree doesn't make it not the Jewish land. Or I think in one of the things that may be a more education for the students has to be, I, yeah, I can support Israel even if I don't agree with what they do here or there, but I can agree with 50%, 40%. I don't need to say I don't agree with, I don't support Israel because I don't agree 100%. So, and I think education about that would be very beneficial for the students that want to be, a, are Jewish and want to support Israel, but feel uncomfortable because they don't agree 100%. It's not, it doesn't have to be, not contradict each other. So um, I hear you. Um, I, I will say that there's a finding that's in the report that I didn't share today that the students we interviewed actually, they know a lot. We talked to a lot of history majors. We talked to a lot of international relations majors, talked to people who went to Israel. Um, they know a lot. They say, they use the phrase, I don't know, a, a fair amount. But what I don't know means isn't, I don't know, like I don't have the knowledge base. What I don't know means is, I've, 
kind of reached the end of this conversation. I'm uncomfortable with the conversation going forward. So I'm going to step out now. We had a student like, um, so when they say, I don't know, it's not for lack of education. The students that we talked to, the students in the, in the Brandeis study, they are like, they're upper middle class, American, Jewish, college students. If they want the information, the information is out there and they can go get it. And, and many of them do, both in formal and informal settings. And so education <clears throat> is, I mean, Education is a great end, and I think for some people, share your view that is education ought to have the end of connecting American Jews to Israel. Education about Israel or about Israel's life and the role in Israel's place in, in the lives of American Jews um, can take a bunch of different uh, courses um, and can take a bunch of different routes. And, and uh, as, as somebody who, is, who studies the lives and interests of American Jews, <clears throat> um, I think that the way that these play out uh, is interesting, but putting the, the um, understanding the ways that they play out um, is interesting, but I don't think that we can foreclose one sort of educational end um, by saying, well, the outcome has to be that they feel a certain way about Israel, when in the rest of their educational lives, they're taught to value critical thought, they're taught to value multiple perspectives, they're taught to value complicated ideas, um, except here, where they have to think a certain way or feel a certain way, which is a lot harder, it's a lot harder to teach people to feel than it is to teach them to think. Um, and so, I want to um, acknowledge your, your concern about the sort of di diminution of the place of Israel in the lives of American Jews. I certainly hear that. But I think educationally, it's a much more complicated uh, terrain. Um, and so I don't think that sort of education, it, it's not one thing, but I don't think it's, it's quite this, I, I, even as somebody who's, a, I, I'm a professor in a school of education. Um, so I obviously think education is important, um, but I hesitate to think that it's going to sort of um, directly channel, uh, channel people in the direction that you think it might. I meant more about not, not education in that way, more about, you know, saying that it's okay to support Israel and being Jews, but not agree with everything. So they don't have to hide their support for, to Israel, and that's what I meant, not as education as they don't know. I didn't mean that. Uh, two things on that note, and then I think we're gonna have to wrap up. One is, um, they don't, they're not hiding their support for Israel. They may not support Israel's uh, uh, acting in the world. So it's not as if they're saying, I do support Israel at home, but on the street, I feel uncomfortable saying it. Their politics are much more complicated and, and flexible than uh -huh. that. First thing. Um, and the second thing uh, you said, it, it was the first thing you said there, um, is um, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Sorry. Okay. Alana and Erica, take it away. Thank you all so much. Um, I really, I feel um, really grateful for the engaged discussion. Um, I know that our partner in planning this series, Professor Stephen M. Cohen does too, because he was, um, you know, giving a big thumbs up to the discussion and as well to you, Professor Kelman, thank you for a really thought provoking presentation. I want to warmly invite you all to join us for the third session of this series on May 22nd. We hope that you'll join us. And we also hope that you'll plug into JPRO's many offerings. And um, if you want more information, check out our website or email us at info at jpro.org. Have a wonderful day. Professor Kelman, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks so much. Feel free to email if you have other questions. Thank you. Take care, everybody.